All right. And so today I have the opportunity to announce uh, and introduce our MC, Stephen Dyer. And we have uh, a unique format. Oh, asked to start video. Let's see if I can pin you, Steve. Oh, hello, Mr. Dyer. Okay. Oh, you are muted, Mr. Dyer. Okay, you're unmuted now. So we have a few questions for Steve as an introduction this evening. And I, now that our cameraman is in place, uh, let's welcome our host. Oh, hello. Oh, hi. So, Steve, are you ready to do your 73 questions to introduce the 2020 History Maker Awards? I absolutely am. Welcome to my home. Come on in. Oh, beautiful. So where are we this evening? So we're in Suffield, Connecticut. We're actually at my parents' house. Beautiful. Oh, and uh, what are you dressing up for for Halloween this year? I think I'm going to be a sexy nurse, but I'm worried it's a little too on the nose. Mm, you might be right. So wedges or pumps? Uh, wedges are not drag, so it's always going to be pumps. And would you do uh, five inches or 11 inches? At this point, I'll take either one. <laughs> so where are you taking us? Um, we're, we're in the kitchen where I'm just uh, whipping up some eggs. Oh, do you like to cook? I love to cook. And how do you take your eggs? Uh, just like me, a little over easy. Hmm. All right. So what's your best habit? My best habit is every day I wake up and meditate. And your worst habit? Uh, my worst habit is I pick my cuticles. Ooh. Now, do you like red or white? Uh, I'm, I'm partial to nebbiolos. Oh, that's uh, beyond my uh, vintner vocabulary. So it's in the Piedmont region of, France, of Italy. Oh, of Italy. My wine comes from the grocery store. So Why don't you get a little more comfortable? Oh, beautiful. Oh, a fire? <coughs> this is really, a, it's a Scott Brown moment that we're having here. The only so, thing he's ever good for. <laughs> what was your first gay bar? My first gay bar was Estate on Thursdays. And what was your last gay bar? Uh, my last gay bar was Peggy O'Neill's. Uh, what was your, who was your first heartbreak? My first heartbreak was Cantwell Muckenfoos. And who's your favorite ex? My favorite ex is Jacob. He works at Twitter. So who's your celebrity crush? Unfortunately, my celebrity crush is Chris Pine. Hey, bro, I know him. Oh, I think that's the wrong Chris. Uh, and Bailey Warren or Bo Obama? <sighs> well, my old neighbor is Bailey, so I'll have to say Bailey. She's such a nice girl. <clears throat> Beautiful. And uh, who do you think is the best drag queen in history? Um, that would be Milky White in the original Broadway cast. Mm -hmm. And the second best drag queen? Uh, Baby Bop. Right. And uh, what are you reading? Um, I'm reading a new book called Hop on Pop. Oh, really? And who are you reading? I'm reading Aaron Tveit. It's the worst performance of his life, and it's the only way he'll get a Tony. Wow. So will you be watching the Tonys this year? Um, yes, I will. And I'll be live tweeting. Excellent. Hopefully no faux pas like uh, Patrick, Neil Patrick Harris a few years ago. So uh, what's your favorite cocktail? Uh, my favorite cocktail is hot vodka in a styrofoam cup. Oh, tasty. And what's your credit score? My credit score is 722. Oh, boy. And how do you get in the mood, Steve? I hum a little ditty to myself. Hmm, and what's your favorite scent? My favorite scent is uh, lavender eucalyptus. Hmm, and what's the best advice you've ever received? The best advice I ever received was you need to choose to be happy. Hmm, and uh, what's your skincare routine? Well, come on in, I'm doing it right now. I use a vegan shark oil called squalene. Vegan sharks. Uh, and 
Are you a rush or a jungle juice girl? I am a double Scorpio girl. <laughs> Wonderful. And uh, do you feel sufficiently indulged to start the program, program this evening? I feel calm and I feel as indulged as a single piece of Dove chocolate. Thank you, Dad. Thank you, Mr. Dyer. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, we're going to kick off the program now. Um, doo -doo -doo. This was not seamless. So, uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2020 History Maker Awards. I'm Steve Dyer, and I'll be your host for the evening. We appreciate that you've joined us in this virtual universe to show your support for our organization and this year's History Maker and Lavender Rhino Award honorees. The mission of the History Project is to document and preserve the history of Boston's LGBTQ communities and to share that history with LGBTQ individuals, organizations, allies, and the public. And if you didn't know, well, now you know. So much of what the History Project does is about creating spaces for people to come together around LGBTQ history and life. In this unprecedented year, a year filled with so much more than ever before, the History Project has been working hard to create spaces online where community members can come together to talk about LGBTQ history, to meet others interested in LGBTQ history, and to, well, see if we can have a little fun as well. Since April of this year, History Project staff and volunteers have hosted 18 virtual Out of the Archives events that have reached a combined audience of more than 1,000 people from around the world. Recording, recordings of this virtual event are available to all uh, to freely access on our YouTube page, where they've been viewed more than two, by more than 2,000 people from around the world. And tonight, you'll learn more about the volunteer-driven work of the History Project. Uh, you'll have a chance to meet some of our other attendees. And finally, you'll hear from our History Maker awardee, Dr. Kenneth Mayer. Uh, doc, uh, Dr. Mayer is the founding medical research director of Fenway Health and co-chair of the Fenway Institute. Uh, but before that, I'd like to introduce History Project board member Andrew Elder, who will present a recently digitized video of a 1950s gay party. And then we'll hop into breakout rooms to do our best impersonation of a cocktail party schmooze fest like we normally get in other years. Hi, everybody. I'm Andrew Elder, a volunteer archivist with the History Project and chair of the organization's board of directors. And, um, I'm going to talk briefly tonight about one of our archival collections, the papers of George Chapin Scott and Edward Bernier. George uh, Scott was born in Heath, Massachusetts in 1916. He first contacted the History Project in 2000 to donate a large collection of local LGBTQ publications and newspapers, including issues of The Guide, Tommy's Connection, and Next. George lived in Somerville and was, among, and was, among other activities, a member of Boston Primetimers and a founding treasurer of the Somerville Committee for a Response to AIDS. George died in 2005 at age 88. Edward, or Eddie, was born in Pennsylvania in 1930 and was a hairdresser in Central Square in Cambridge. Eddie was George's partner until Eddie died in a car accident on Cape Cod in early 1961. After George passed away in 2005, a lot of his stuff was thrown out and left on the side of the road. Um, a Somerville uh, neighbor of his, Julie Katz, found his collection on the ground by chance and picked up as much as she could carry. She later contacted the History Project about donating the collection, which includes materials such as letters, address books, business cards, pamphlets and publications, and newspaper clippings. Photographs constitute a large part of the collection, though. There are a number of photographs of Eddie, sometimes in drag, as well as photographs that document life in Provincetown in the 1950s, including this photograph on the right uh, that shows Eddie and friends in costumes, probably on Halloween. Also in the Scott and Bernier collection were two eight millimeter film reels, which the History Project has digitized and which I'm going to show you some snippets from here tonight. The films are about five minutes each, but we've edited, edited them down to just over a minute. Um, and because they're silent, we've added some moody background music. I'm going to share that screen and we'll take a look. Mm -hmm. 
So we will be we will be posting the these full videos to our digital collection site soon. So you should um, visit historyproject.org to see those. And otherwise, I'm going to turn turn it back to Steve. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so now uh, we're going to go into breakout rooms. And before I go, I want to kind of set this up. So Joan has actually been spending hours on the seating chart for these breakout rooms um, for like a fun clue like game. Uh, when you go into your breakout rooms, everyone in there is going to have a secret attribute that everyone shares in common. It could be your star sign, it could be your favorite Madonna album, uh, or it could be your favorite Subway sandwich. See if you can figure it out. Um, so, Because Joan is not only a historian, she also has some psychic powers. Have fun, and we'll see you in five minutes. Back. All right. Hello, Steve. Hello, Joan. Welcome back, everybody. Um, if you were able to figure out what the secret thing was linking you with your with your breakout group, um, I would really encourage you to put it in the chat. Um, that would be really terrific to see what kind of, uh, okay, so one group had all blue eyes. My group had all A, all people started with A in their first name until I showed up and ruined it. Um, I actually, uh, and then just while, while people are coming, are, are putting that in, um, I did have the luck to be put in uh, into a room with uh, Dr. Mayer's sister. And she told me all sorts of awesome stories about what he was like when he was a kid. And I'm not gonna tell any of them because she swore me to secrecy. Um, so anyway, that is terrific, all these things in the chat because the real answer is that um, there was, it was completely randomly assorted and we just wanted to have a little icebreaker um, Oh, we were all, we all were clueless. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> That's great. Um, okay, so anyway, now I'm going to uh, turn it over to the uh, to Joan Alacqua. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. So I have a uh, short list of thank yous that I want to share with you all. Um, and for those of you who don't know me, I've been kind of flitting around this this event. I'm Joan Alacqua. I'm executive director of the History Project. And so, um, first of all, my first thank you is to our honoree, Ken Mayer, for joining us tonight, um, and to Kevin Cranston, uh, with whom Ken will be speaking. And um, now, I'd like to thank the History Maker Awards Planning Committee. That year, it includes Carissa Cunningham, Andrew Elder, Ben Fetterlin, Tony Grimma, and Jessica Taylor. Uh, we all went to so many Zoom meetings to put this event together. Uh, I'm sure you can all commiserate with that during this time. And I'd also like to thank tonight's MC, Steve Dyer. And now to thank our 2020 host committee, without whom this event would not be possible. Um, at our underground historian level, I'd like to thank Libby Bouvier and Andrea Devine, Andrew Elder and Jose Ricardo McFallion Figueroa, Jim Gibson, Pat Gazemba and Karen Kahn, Tony Grimma and Peter Muse, Joe Alacqua and Sarah Marina, Marvin Kabakoff, Mark Crone, Louise Rice, Martha Stone, Jessica Taylor, Kenneth Torino, and Christopher Matias. 
And then I'd like to thank those who contributed at our direct action documenter level, Bruce Bell and George Smart, Nandu Ma, Neil Kane and Ch uh, Charles Schoonmaker, Stuart Landers, Russell Lopez and Andrew Sherman. And uh, last but certainly not least, I'd like to thank our community curator uh, level donor, Kevin Hafner. Thank you all for making this event possible and for supporting the work of the History Project. Thank you also to everyone who joined the host committee or friends of the History Project level and all who have donated at every level. Uh, your support makes our work possible. So if you're interested, please visit historyproject.org slash events to learn more about our host committee, um, our event sponsors and our supporters and host committee opportunities are still available. So uh, you can learn more about that on our website. So now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ken Mayer, who is one of this year's History Maker Award honorees. Dr. Kenneth Mayer is founding medical director of Fenway Health and co-chair of the Fenway Institute, and one of the first clinical researchers in Boston to see patients with HIV and AIDS. Throughout his career, he has made a significant impact by researching, mentoring, and teaching, and providing care to people living with HIV. Tonight, Ken will be in conversation with Kevin Cranston, who is Assistant Commissioner in the Massachusetts Bureau of Public Health and the Director of the State's Bureau of Infectious Disease and Laboratory Sciences. Definitely not busy during this time. Uh, Ken and Kevin will be in conversation with each other and then we'll moderate a Q&A with our audience. So welcome, Ken and Kevin. Oh, and stop share. If I can make Zoom work for me. Okay. Where are you, Ken and Kevin? Okay. Ken, unmute. Kevin, unmute. Thank you, Joan. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Hi, Joan, and thank you so much for that introduction. Ken, absolute congratulations on this well earned award. You are a giant in the local community around LGBT health, medical research, um, and an international star. And we're so glad to have you. As Betty Davis famously said, it's about time. <laughs> Thank um, you, Kevin. The feeling is mutual. Kevin's been around for quite a while, too, from, from the get-go. So you've done amazing things as well. I tell you, I, I, I knew you before I knew you, Ken. But I really don't remember the first time we met. I'm really trying to place it, but it is more years ago than we're going to talk about. Um, I, I decided to ask for your CV just to, to freshen up. I figured, you know, I could read a, a few, couple of pages and, you know, remind myself of the handful of things you, you've done. Um, I, I, I stopped at page 337 of 338. Um, and uh, it is absolutely, I mean, phenomenal contribution to, to the life and work of the city, of the country, and of the world, the kinds of contributions you have made. Um, so before we go back in time, and we will go about a little bit back in time, I'm just curious what you make of the current historical moment. And you can take that and go anywhere you want with it. Um, before um, before folks join the, the call, you said you were going, weren't going to ask me about COVID-19. but That's Certainly, I'd be remiss to not uh, talk about the, the pandemic. Um, you know, uh, at the beginning of the AIDS epidemic, we thought we had pretty clueless leadership, at, which exacerbated um, a worsening um, global um, pandemic. And we were right. Certainly, the Reagan administration was not uh, proactive, and a lot of things could have been done earlier that might have um, attenuated the spread of the pandemic. But what we're seeing now is, is you know, it's incompetence and criminality, you know, um, together. I mean, there's just been so poorly handled, but we are where we are. And, you know, there are things we can do in the near future over the next few weeks that will change things. And there are things we can do as individuals, uh, you know, to, to move forward. Uh, that, that, that's a prompt to all of us to do what we can do individually, eh? Um, so let's, let's go back a little bit. I know you have some family members here and I'm, I'm welcome to the, the, the mayor family. Um, just talk a little bit about where you grew up and a little about your family and uh, just put us, put us in your childhood for a moment. Uh, well, I was born in Kew Garden Hills, New York, but uh, grew up uh, outside of Philadelphia in Southern New Jersey. Uh, my dear sister's here with her husband, kids, and my um, 
uh, grandniece, which is very exciting, uh, who's uh, just about a month old, uh, which is uh, very exciting. Uh, Congratulations, uh, all. Thank you. Um, but, you know, I think what informs my work, uh, I certainly know it has a big influence on my sister as well, is that we're first generation. Our parents were German Jewish refugees, and I think um, that informs a sense that the world, A, is capricious and that we have to, you know, do what we can to make the world a better place. The expression uh, in Hebrew, tikkun olam, uh, to uh, better the world. And I think that's an important uh, thing that, you know, we all, um, um, you know, should strive to do. And I was very fortunate because I wasn't paying enough attention to school. My folks were despairing and I ended up going to a, a Quaker high school to be a little more stimulated, which I think also informs a lot of my uh, uh, major influence. Um, I um, was a psychology major as undergrad, uh, and, um, was somewhat involved in student activism at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and it all of a sudden had an aha moment when I was traveling uh, in uh, Central Europe uh, in 1971 when I went to Freud's house and said, oh, mind, body, gee, you know, it'd be really good to understand more physiology as well as the behavioral issues. And that's when I decided to go to medical school. But uh, I also noticed that Richard Pillard, who's sort of the dean of, uh, of Boston psychiatrists writ large, uh, uh, will be amused. But um, when I finally went to medical school, uh, the psychiatrists uh, were so conservative uh, homophobic, but also just, I, I didn't find it very intellectually um, um, exciting. And I, I realized uh, to my surprise that I really just like um, more general medicine much better. And so I uh, decided to elect to do a general medicine um, residency and came here to Boston to Beth Israel to do that. And uh, some of the social influences there were um, some activist physicians, one of them, Jerry Friedland, that some people may have heard of, who's now at uh, Yale, uh, who was also working at Dimmick Community Health Center. So that also gave me the sense that I could work in the community and do um, research and try to have the best of both worlds. And I feel very fortunate to have been able to do that uh, most of my career. Thank you. Well, I'm going to go back to some of those because there's, there's some juice in there that I want to I want to uh, extract. Um, but first, um, what's your Kinsey score? What's my Kinsey score? Yeah. Uh, You'll have to explain. To some of the people on the phone may not know that. I, Feel free. I forget. Um, I I'm going to guess, a, though. I'm going to say it's a 5.9. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, then people, uh, I think you're probably right. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, in, in terms of sexual preference, I sort of, uh, um, you know, I, I think these things are hardwired. I certainly, certainly not. I certainly think, unlike uh, Justice uh, uh, Amy uh, Coney Bryan, I, I don't think it's a preference. I think these are. Uh, sort of intrinsic characteristics that people have. Mm -hmm. and so I'm close. I'm, I'm in the range. Yeah. So if if if, if six six is same sex preference and uh, one is uh, heterosexual preference, I'd certainly be more at the other end of the five point nine six end of the scale. Well, welcome to my side of the scale. So <laughs> delighted. Um, in the early 70s, the medical profession was not particularly friendly to LGBTQ individuals. Um, how did you manage as a gay man, if, the, if that's the language you used at that time in, in medical school and pursuing a medical career? Um, medical school was in Chicago at Northwestern. And, uh, uh, you know, I think people, I think it was an era where people were so clueless that it really, uh, sexuality didn't really come up. And I think uh, by the time I got to Boston, I was more comfortable with my sexuality. I, you know, I sense that there, there may have been um, academic, uh, you know, opportunities uh, that might not have um, been as available because of people wondering about, about uh, reliability. But I think some of that, you know, uh, for me, unfortunately, it's conflated with the fact that I did something that you're not encouraged to do um, in medical academia. Um, you know, in Boston is certainly uh, sort of the, uh, you know, the arch place for, for that. And you're really not encouraged to sort of do two things that are not, um, that don't overlap. So I kind of still had this desire to do community work. So um, I finished my residency and started volunteering at Fenway uh, initially, and then um, uh, thought that there was a real need to do research, community-based research. Um, and there was some mistrust of researchers because Fenway, which was founded in 19, 
71 by um, local community activists um, and had a couple of um, um, sort of collective groups uh, had a women's health collective, had a gay men's collective, um, had a drop in SD clinic. And that, that, that um, the executive director at the time, Sally Dean, who um, got me involved, said, you know, you can help us by doing, by helping us with our sexually transmitted infections. And I said, but it'd be great to do some research as well. There's so many things we don't know. This is 1980. And she said, well, you know, um, we've been kind of ripped off by the, the research. They come in, they take specimens, they never give us results. And so it really took uh, about a year to build trust. And I hadn't realized that in the course of that year between 80 and 81, um, the AIDS epidemic would ensue. Um, but uh, a colleague, uh, Don Snelling is here who uh, trained with the same mentor I had at the Brigham who's more famous as Conan O'Brien's father, uh, Thomas Francis O'Brien, a brilliant man who's um, world expert on antibiotic resistance. And so I had this, my day job as a research fellow was studying the molecular epidemiology of, of drug resistance um, because we were worried about superbugs as we still are now. Yep. Um, but I did this community service. And I remember when I finished my fellowship, uh, when I was finishing my fellowship, I said to my program director, you know, um, the AIDS epidemic had just started. I said to him, you know, I, I'm, you know, I have enough training in epidemiology to be dangerous. And, you know, may, maybe I should, uh, you know, try to uh, develop the cohorts here at Fenway because this is the place where we're starting to see people who are getting sick uh, and, you know, do some studies here, but still do my antibiotic resistance work. And he basically said, you know, you have a perfectly good laboratory skill now. You know how to um, use molecular uh, techniques to cut up uh, resistance factors and to characterize them. Why would you want to spend your time working on this other thing? And it's definitely trying to be slotted. And um, there, were, there weren't um, a whole lot of positions around Boston that would let you do both. So I was very fortunate uh, 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 to, uh, I'll find a position at uh, Brown University. Uh, I also see on, on the, the screen my uh, mentor, uh, Steve Zinner, who was uh, uh, chief of infectious disease at the time, was very supportive of my um, doing the work in Rhode Island, but continuing the work at Fenway. So for, for a long time, it was like two full-time jobs, for, uh, but, but intellectually fulfilling. But eventually, as the HIV, as we started having treatments and with the promise of uh, uh, preventive approaches, it really um, became untenable to be doing both things at the same time. We, we chatted just going back to a brief conversation we had a moment ago. Uh, you, you're usually on the move, you know. Uh, you, you shuttle back and forth between Providence and Boston. You you traveled internationally most of your career, and you're almost somewhere else, always somewhere else. Whenever I write to you, and you'll drop me a note, and you, sometimes you're on a plane to somewhere else. What's it like being in one place for a while right now? Um, I like it a lot. I mean, I feel much more centered and, and certainly uh, not, not experiencing jet lag is, is very pleasant. Uh, I don't like the reason for it. So that's, that's the problem. Uh, you know, so as, as everybody on the Zoom um, is experiencing, that's, that's the challenge. Um, and this pandemic is not going to go away tomorrow. So that's, you know, I don't anticipate being on plane very soon. Yeah. So let's go back to your internship, your residency at Beth Israel, correct? Is that? Uh-huh. Um, and that was just before the emergence of HIV or a knowledge of the emergence of HIV in our world. What was clinical practice for you like in Boston, on, right on the brink, on the cusp of the HIV epidemic? Um, you know, Beth, Beth Israel has uh, prided itself in being uh, more um, uh, patient focused than, than the, uh, than the um, other uh, two major Harvard teaching hospitals the Brigham and Mass, Mass General, uh, which are more considered more rigorous academically at, at the time. I think both have really changed a lot over the years in terms of embracing uh, inclusion. So I, so I, I had a, a number of mentors there that were very uh, patient-centered. Uh, the training was was excellent, uh, really, you know, very rigorous people. And as, as I mentioned, there were, were a couple of the infectious disease physicians who really um, understood what social medicine was. So that was very uh, fulfilling. So I felt I got a lot, uh, a lot of that experience. Very sleep deprived. Back in those days, that was the era of uh, every third night on call. And if you were in the ICU rotation or the emergency room rotation, it was every other night. So you basically left the hospital, went back home, slept, went back to the hospital, you know, left the hospital, went home and slept. And it's really kind of crazy. So you're not in your right mind for several years because of sleep deprivation. 
1980s when I transitioned uh, across Longwood Avenue to Brigham and Women's Hospital mm -hmm. and started my infectious disease fellowship. Yep. So I was one year into infectious disease fellowship um, and working um, uh, um, half day uh, half day week evening session at Fenway when uh, we first heard the reports of the AIDS epidemic. So oh, we, we have to talk about those days and I know these are hard memories and it was a hard time, um, but it, you were so central to that work and so important to so many people I know. You, you, were, you took care of people I knew in those, in those early days and I thank you for that. Is there, I, 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 can't, I can't even do the what was it like, it's too big a question. And, and uh, is, there, is there a patient you remember from those days? that you can talk to us about? So many, uh, you know, uh, um, he, he, well, um, I'll get two extremes, patient uh, and then a patient slash friend. Uh, um, the um, patient uh, was uh, a, a young man who um, um, within the first year or two of the epidemic uh, was from one of the Towns uh, just passed 128. Uh, was going to college in, in town and started developing one of the worst cases of Kaposi sarcoma that I'd ever seen. Um, it was a very strange case of Kaposi sarcoma because it um, invaded um, the lymph nodes. Uh, uh, so it was acting more like a lymphoma or a malignancy. So he's going to need chemotherapy and his had very nice, very concerned parents. And father was a school administrator. And it was clear that he had not discussed his sexuality with his parents. And uh, the epidemic had so much stigma. And it was quite uncomfortable having very involved uh, father of a you know, 20, 21 year old and saying, well, why, why is he not responding so well to this cancer? Uh, you know, and, and the father just, you know, wanting it to be cancer and feeling, you know, uh, uh, the need, you know, that uh, he must have been 21 because I felt that's right. Because I mean, felt like this, is, there's not a parental overreach where I really have liberty to say exactly. And I talked to the patient about, you know, um, you know, really should, you know, you might want to tell your folks what this is, you know, and there's more and more about, AIDS and the parents just were really not understanding what was what was going on for the longest time. That was very, uh, you know, that was emblematic of a lot, a lot of situation at that, that time. Um, you know, uh, and, you know, and then somebody else who many people on the call might remember is Fred Mandel, who's a very dear friend who uh, was a community activist who uh, uh, was the first executive director of of, of, of the uh, Boston Equal Opportunity uh, Commission, and just you know, very very public and very out there was uh, uh, the, the first executive director of the Community Research Initiative, New England, and uh, you know really uh, you know fun and you know had a very long and valiant but uh, tragic uh, struggle with uh, the epidemic, and so you know was just you know typical of the kind of um, you know heads of the Hydra that every time you felt like you treated one infection or, or one problem, uh, two others would show up. And uh, yeah. it's really quite a, a long and uh, difficult um, struggle. But that was very much what many people on the call may remember with uh, friends and loved ones uh, during that difficult period through the 80s. So you, you've lived through it all. How do you reflect? As of you though, as of many people, you know. Okay. And uh, you know, there, 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 there's pain and loss, but there are great gifts along the way. Can you speak about um, sort of where we are now in the HIV epidemic, pandemic, and you know, what, wh how, how it looks from your perspective today, given what you've lived through? Yeah, no, I, I'd be happy to. So, you know, when you said gifts, I mean, the first thing I thought you might be asking is just, you know, wh what are some of the things, uh, you know, out of the tragedy, out of the the cauldron out of the fire, what are some things that emerge? And I think just the, you know, the resilience of community, the, uh, the um, um, sense of solidarity. And I think, you know, uh, very much for us at, at Fenway, it was the kind of skills you needed to address the 
epidemic in terms of developing a clinical infrastructure to take care of people. And then uh, developing community-based research really grew out of that. And when we finally could catch our breath, you know, I mean, uh, can divide uh, the, pan the AIDS pandemic into multiple slices. And certainly, you know, for much of the first decade, we didn't have any effective treatment on AZT clinical trials, 87, 89. But, it, you know, then we had this period uh, for at least five years where we were getting monotherapy and the drugs had a fair amount of toxicity. Then we said two are better than one, but the drugs, um, the drugs had even more side effects and ridiculous pill burdens. And then three drugs are better than two. Uh, and it wasn't until the protease inhibitors came on the scene, and that's 95. So you have uh, 15 years into uh, an epidemic where before you have really effective therapy, and even that wasn't you know a, a picnic. But by the late 90s, um, you know things were you know getting into focus where. Uh, the treatments were better, they were more manageable, there clearly was a survival benefit and was a different error. And, um, you know, places that had really been um, just struggling, you know, to, to really do the best job possible to keep up, like Fenway, just were able to sort of take a deep breath. And I think part of our deep breath was saying um, the same skill sets, you know, being able to do clinical trials, clinical care, um, needing to understand behavioral science because we we're focusing on adherence, uh, on depression, uh, on people's experiences of violent victimization, understanding that there were social and structural factors that were drivers of, um, of the epidemic. All that was also relevant for lesbians and for uh, um, bisexual people and transgender people. And that led to just the, this intentionality to um, develop a much broader research focus and uh, recruiting colleagues like uh, Judy Bradford of Blessed Memory. So, um, you know, so that, that, that sort of was, you know, the next, you know, really getting to the next point of uh, uh, HIV AIDS being an important um, issue and it's still an important issue, but it's not the only issue affecting uh, uh, sexual gender minority people. And it's just sort of understanding that or health context, I think was that next error. So where we are now, I mean, what's, you know, gratifying is that the treatments are incredibly, um, potent and because of co-formulation, uh, you know, people can be very effectively treated with a single pill once a day. And uh, there are enough different choices that, uh, God forbid somebody has a side effect, there usually is a second or a third regimen that they can try that will be, you know, equally well tolerated. I mean, will be well tolerated and equally as, as potent. So that's good in terms of treatment. And in terms of um, prevention, uh, it's been gratifying that we've been part of uh, um, a group of researchers that have really focused on the use of antivirals for prevention and, you know, the demonstration that pre-exposure prophylaxis, you know, can protect people. And that's being iterated now. So we're at the next generation where uh, we were part of a study that showed that you can give an injection every eight weeks and protect people against HIV uh, successfully. But, you know, there are lots of, lots of things that need to be um, um, refined, you know, so it's not like everything is perfect and end of story. And these, you know, we don't have a cure and we don't have a vaccine. And, uh, um, you know, about a year ago, one of the large HIV vaccine trials was not successful, uh, but we're in the middle of a, a second set of trials, st studies in North and South America for men of sex with men and transgender women, a study focusing on African heterosexuals, two parallel trials that are underway. So, uh, you know, it, those studies, we won't have answers for the next couple of years. Uh, so you know, vaccine is possible, but we don't know that, but we certainly have effective treatment and effective prevention. But then all the other issues, uh, the individual behavioral issues, uh, people who have experienced, uh, you know, non-affirming lives um, may be uh, uh, less prone to engage well with the healthcare system. Uh, the concept of intersectionality, people who are uh, dual minorities, racial ethnic minorities, uh, as well as sexual gender minorities, um, and not being affirmed it, by each of their respective uh, communities, uh, uh, that can lead to adverse health outcomes. So I think we're, um, we know that the pills are very um, effective. The pills and the shots now are very effective, but they don't take themselves. So we have to pay more attention to the individual behavioral and the social structural issues if we're going to get it right. Yeah. In, in fact, you led right into where I was hoping you were going to go because I, 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 I know this and it's, it's replete throughout your, your resume that you maintain this balance between an investment in the social, personal, psychological, 
and behavioral aspects of being a person and the, the benefits of biomedical interventions. But your, your work is completely balanced across those, those realms. I know that that is not necessarily a popular way to pursue your research career that there tends to be a biomedical track or there tends to be a behavioral track and you've always kept those together. How have you managed to do that throughout your career successfully? You know, I think that ultimately, you know, um, I wish I believed in reincarnation, but I, I, you know, I'm sort of an agnostic, so I don't not believe in it. But, you know, if you only have one life to leave, you have to do things that make intrinsic logic to yourself. So to me, um, these things are integrated and you're not going to, you know, you want to have maximal benefit for individuals and maximum public health benefit, you have to do these things in an integrated way. Now, uh, some of my colleagues, I think at different points have thought of me either as a dilettante or a little too, you know, it's a little too diffuse and, you know, you take your docs, you know, um, and, you know, but, you know, I think if you, you know, you I have to laugh at that, Ken, I'm sorry, dilettante, really? <laughs> in some people's mind, but you know, I, I think I'm very lucky because I work in a very, uh, Wonderful intentional community. So you know, uh, you know, over the years, uh, being being grounded, you know, at Fenway has been really um, a great place uh, um, to start from because of uh, the people I work with. And and you know, and, and and again, I'm very fortunate that the people who do primary care there do such an excellent job. So I continue to learn from them. And it's a, it's a wonderful iterative process because if I go to an international conference and I learn something, I'd go back and do an in-service. But I'd also always ask folks, well, what are you doing and trying to understand about the diffusion of innovation and in practice or, you know, or, um, what are people hearing, what are people seeing? So I think it's a, it's a good way to um, learn. Um, I'm going to go back in time a little bit in your research career. Uh, I want to talk about Project Explore. Um, it, it was a big chunk of your life, right? You know, that, was, that, was a, that was a major study. Um, what, what major lesson do you take away personally? From your work in Project Explore, and maybe explain a little to the folks. Yeah, yeah, no, that's such an interesting question, um, and I, I don't know if you are going to predict my answer or not. Uh, so, so Project Explore, um, this is before we had pre-exposure prophylaxis. So this um, th uh, this was big science writ large. So uh, uh, um, we've been part of uh, a number of these different networks funded by the National Institutes of Health over the years, and so this was a big NIH project. Uh, very famous behavioral uh, scientist in San Francisco named Tom Coates uh, um, uh, led this project and his colleague Margaret Chesney. And they sort of said, let's do a behavioral kitchen sink approach to try to change people's behavior, people who are at high risk for HIV, who are not using condoms consistently. Um, so to do this, because uh, we don't know that it's going to be like giving people a highly effective vaccine. So we have to have a large enough number that we can show a modest benefit so they estimated that they needed 4,500 people to be enrolled in the study, and, and they wanted to be at multiple sites so that it would have geographic uh, uh, diversity. So it was six cities across the US. So our task at Fenway was to enroll um, between 725 and 750 participants. And half the participants sort of got what was standard counseling and testing, and we'll see you in a few months. Uh, and the other half got a 10 session very um, elaborate uh, uh, behavioral intervention. State and, of the art, uh, if I recall. Sorry? It was state of the art, if I recall. State of the art at the time. Yeah. And, and, and the study was not at all successful. I mean, if, you, if your success measure was, um, was, were the rates of new HIV infection any different than the people who got the, um, the Cadillac version of counseling versus the people who got um, um, standard counseling and testing? So you could say, um, um, the lesson learned, we put a lot of resources into, uh, you know, in, into the study that um, wasn't productive. But ironically, it has given us so much. And I mean, two very specific issues. Uh, one was that um, it, it was one of these studies that had this huge battery to assess people's uh, um, um, risk. So it asked about uh, use various scores to determine levels of depression substance use, relationship dynamics. Um, and uh, so we knew an awful lot about the people who went into the study. And so one of the, the papers that came out of the study uh, published in the American Journal of Public Health um, basically showed that among people who are very risky for HIV, among men of such and men who are risky for HIV, 
uh, there was no one consistent pattern. It wasn't like everybody was using crystal meth or that everybody was depressed, but mm -hmm. it turned out that there were potentially about 60 patterns of behavior um, and that at least one person in, in the group had one of those patterns and no one pattern um, um, was expressed by uh, more than 15, 16% of the population. So that, that led to a whole new generation of thinking about you have to tailor uh, prevention interventions. You can't sort of think you're going to give people some cookie cutter thing in one size will fit all. And I, that really influenced a lot of subsequent work. It also made clear that probably you'd need uh, bi bio, um, medical interventions as well as behavioral if you're really going to get, get some tra traction on this. It also pointed out this issue of syndemics that we now talk about a lot. Uh, and for those in the audience who are not familiar, this is synergistic epidemics, but show that the people who are riskiest were more likely to be depressed, more likely to use substances, more likely to have experienced child, childhood abuse. Um, and so all of a sudden, um, these other things became targets for HIV prevention as well. And then the last thing that I think was a big benefit, uh, which, uh, you know, thank you, Uncle Sam, is that um, to do a study like that, you had to hire a large number of uh, very idealistic 20-something uh, research assistants and I'm just so proud of so many of those individuals who started off with Project Explore, have gone on and gotten PhDs, gone to medical school, become um, um, directors of major uh, uh, programs of prevention. Thanks to your mentoring, Ken, I might add. Well, uh, thanks to their own brilliance and a lot of the other people I work with, but, uh, uh, but they're um, uh, people who have, have played prominent roles, uh, even including in state government in this Commonwealth if, uh, um, were alumni of Project Explore. Very good. So let's, let's, you, you brushed by one of the most important studies you've been involved in, which is the IPREC study, right? And I, if folks don't know, it really was the study, the international study that demonstrated the effectiveness of pre-exposure prophylaxis, one of the great breakthroughs in HIV prevention. And in large measure, due to your work, Ken, Boston was one of the two um, U.S. Um, locations for that study. So people in Boston got access to PrEP long before others did. Um, and so I want to ask you, you know, you know, what has your involvement in that seminal piece of work meant to you personally? Well, I, you know, I mean, I, I, I think, uh, again, having seen, you know, friends, um, you know, get sick and die of AIDS, uh, you know, the idea that you could actually have a very effective means to prevent it, and it was as simple as taking a pill a day, uh, was, you know, really, really meaningful and certainly being able to, you know, to, to know that I or anybody else could lower their risk by, by, by doing that, you know, it's unlinked the idea of, um, you know, uh, and I, as an infectious disease doctor, I have to say I'm a little ambivalent, it's unlinked the idea that safer sex means having to use condoms all the time, you know, because as an infectious disease doctor, we also want to make sure that people understand that um, condoms protect you against other things besides HIV and if people um, don't want to get, um, syphilis or, or um, um, you know, gonorrhea that um, these, um, you know, particularly, sorry, particularly gonorrhea, syphilis is a little bit trickier since there's oral transmission as, as well. But, but in other words, you know, um, PrEP is not a panacea for all things sexual, but it certainly, again, um, you know, creates the ability to have a very powerful preventive tool. And like anything in research, uh, the initial study was proof of principle, and now we're iterating it so that there, you know, in the next few years, uh, we already know that there's a vaginal ring that can protect women uh, from HIV that contains antiretroviral medication, and that may be further refined to have dual protection. So there may be hormonal contraception, so a woman could insert a, a ring, a vaginal ring, once a month, and have protection against HIV and against pregnancy. Um, and there's um, um, injectable uh, medication that may be um, co-formulated with with hormonal medication. So it's nice um, for, for per, you know, uh, within the Boston community where the, um, the disproportionate number of new infections are, I know it's with men, it's great to be part of a study that had international um, implications for one group, the one demographic initially, but really has wider applicability uh, for right. anybody who might be at risk for HIV now. You played a uh... Uh, leadership role in the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association in, in, in its relatively early days um, in AMFAR, particularly the GMT group, the you know gay men and transgender group. 
Um, how has this work and those organizations uh, transform medicine, particularly as, as it aims to meet the particular needs of LG, G, LGBTQ individuals? Well, they're very, very different organizations. Interesting to uh, uh, mention them both because because uh, GLMA is it's really more of a support organization, particularly for um, um, pe uh, people in medical school and in training, and it, it, again, kind of makes people feel less isolated and uh, you know, um, provides you know peer peer support and role models. So it's 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 you know much more at that level. I don't think of um, you know of um, GLMA of having had a major impact on public policy, but it's just you know it's just, just you know sort of it's a I see it as a supportive community role. I suppose yeah. AMFAR, um, you know, both both on um, you know um, issues related to gay men and transgender people in particular, but but even more broadly, I've, uh, AMFAR is something sort of an uh, organization I've been involved with in different ways for quite a number of years. I mean, I was really uh, uh, enchanted when I first met uh, Mathilde Krim years ago. She came mm -hmm. to um, speak at the Human Rights Campaign uh, Fund, and and uh, one of the chairs of the event that year. Um, felt like she needed to have somebody sitting next to her at the dinner table who um, could talk to her about science or what was going on in the AIDS epidemic in Boston. That's how I got to meet her in, uh, in the mid 80s. And, uh, and then I uh, was on the board and, and various scientific advisory capacities. So AMPAR has been very um, uh, catalytic in terms of um, using, you know, using uh, initial grants and sometimes being able to fund things more in a way that's more innovative uh, than the government uh, where the government may Already fund things that already you know have some promise, so they're they're much less, they're much more risk averse, you know. And I think Ampar uh, can can support things that might push the envelope a bit. Uh, so they've done that both in some of the basic science, and then they funded a number of projects uh, internationally. And that's the GMT initiative, uh, again, and transgender initiative, was to support um, 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 partnerships between non-governmental organizations and researchers in in places that have less supportive environments for uh, LGBT people and trying to um, uh, do work that can, um, you know, advance knowledge, but also can have imp influence, uh, you know, the society so that uh, society is less uh, restrictive uh, for people. Um, the theme of activism, it, which you mentioned as part of your undergraduate work, really pervades every aspect of your work. And you, um, you, you bring that personal force and that notion that something needs to change to everything you do. As I mentioned earlier, you when sometimes I'll write to you and you always get right back. I never get right back. You always get right back. Even if you're on a plane, you, you, you wrote me once on the plane to Kuala Lumpur. Yeah. Um, you know, How do you remember that? We had a whole exchange, in fact, while you were flying. Oh. Uh, I guess it was a long flight. Yeah. Um, but I, I, you know, you've written me and I'm aware of your work in India, Indonesia, Vietnam, South Africa. Um, and India, I know, is particularly close to your heart. And I think you, you've spent so much of your time there um, in Chennai. And, and I was just curious if you could talk a little bit about your interest in global health to begin with, but particularly what part of your work in India most informs your work here? Oh, interesting question. Um, you know, I, I have to say, um, Again, you know, in, in research and science, one thing in, uh, informs the others. So um, I uh, got involved the, with um, a program uh, from the Fogarty International Center, which is the, the uh, National Institutes of Health's um, uh, programs for foreign research. And um, we, well, um, had, when I was at Brown University, where we were doing uh, work in the Philippines and in Indonesia, uh, and went to a uh, conference in Asia about AIDS in Asia and the Pacific. And one of the residents at Brown, um, um, her family was uh, Tamil American. You know, uh, Tamil Nadu is the uh, state where Ch Chennai is the capital, so southeastern um, India, uh, formerly called Madras in, in the British era. Um, and so one of the residents, uh, she was born in the US, but her family was uh, from Chennai. And she said, there, um, this was like, uh, early 90s, I guess, yeah, about 25 years, maybe 25 years ago, and um, said there's this wonderful woman who created this non-governmental organization, and uh, her name's Sunidhi Solomon, and 
uh, she's going to be at that conference and can you meet her because maybe she can get involved with the program. And I said, well, we're mainly focusing on these other countries, but, but I, I met Dr. Solomon. I was incredibly impressed. And you know, one has to just be open-minded because um, a few years earlier, uh, the NIH's attitude was India is such a hard place to work. They, they kind of mistrust of external relationships. And at the time, it was, um, still not much past the Cold War that uh, the perception was it's not, not a country we do a lot with. So I said, I'm happy to talk to her and we met and I thought she was great. But I didn't know that there's gonna be the ability to collaborate. And within a year, uh, the numbers started coming in that there was gonna be um, a really um, horrific uh, um, epidemic in India. It was already starting. And then I said, gee, anybody who has the ability to set up collaboration in India, we'd really like you to expand your work there, and it, there was this, this opportunity based on that initial meeting. Um, and the, the, um, the patients that they saw in, in Chennai uh, were uh, primarily heterosexual. They were urban underclass people uh, where the epidemic was spreading. Um, so not the same demographics at Fenway, but but she, she had been a government um, researcher, and um, she had a graduate student in uh, the early 90s and, and the graduate student's project was to develop an assay to look for uh, antibodies uh, to HIV. And they um, tested a, a group of sex workers and they found um, a number of them were already in, infected. And the government initially was saying, we don't, you know, don't, we don't think that's right. You're probably doing the assay wrong. And, 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 and she had some connections with Hopkins and they, with the boats Hopkins. They said, no, you're absolutely right. And she was just so, annoyed at the government trying to suppress things because uh, you knew, you, just like now, you can't, you can't argue with an infection. You have to pay attention and understand how it's going to spread and then address it. the truth, don't they? Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, so she, she set up this community-based organization with uh, some family funding and, you know, very different um, history than Fenway, but it was still, there was a sense of community-based, but a commitment to doing um, really, um, good research and it was a natural affinity. So we um, um, we actually had it, um, an NIH grant to help train her team to be able to do clinical research. And they're now a world, world-class world organization doing clinical research uh, uh, in India very much on their own and, and informed the World Health Organization guidelines. And they're, they're one of the leaders now in the response to COVID-19. She unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago pancreatic cancer um, um, uh, too early, but um, we said that her, but her, her progeny are, are continuing to work. Um, very different story, um, another part of India in, in Mumbai, in Bombay, um, uh, there um, 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 colleagues told me about an organization there called Humpsafar Trust that was didn't really have a, much of a clinic, but they were sort of the largest uh, sort of LGBT uh, support organization and we're starting to get into HIV counseling and testing. So when, uh, several times after I started developing the collaboration in Chennai, I would stop up in Mumbai and try to get a sense of their organization. They, they seemed like they had great capacity and, and uh, again, another really strong community-based organization. So we um, set up a bunch of collaborations with Fenway, helped them set up their um, own institutional review board and they're, they're thriving as well. So, so the two different parts of the country so two different kinds of collaboration. The, the YRG one is more um, traditional clinical research uh, in a community-based setting, and Humpsport is uh, much broader in terms of community and social determinants of health kinds of issues. And you are the gift that keeps on giving. So I really, really appreciate it. And I know well, you- The people I work with are the gift. You know, right. they do. You yeah. always do. You, you always give the credit to your collaborators. And uh, I, as someone who has- We don't do it by ourselves, you know? Of course not, but you know, it doesn't start by itself either. And uh, I, I've, I've had the pleasure, some of my, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not a clinician, I'm not an epidemiologist, I'm a, you know, a state administrator, but I've had the opportunity to participate in some research activities. It's some of the stuff that I'm most proud of are the things I've done with you, Ken. Um, one of them being a, a study of um, black gay men and other men who have sex with men. Um, it was a relatively small study that generated a lot of science. And uh, uh, I guess I want to ask, looking back, have you've done tons of that work, and I would just want to look like, you know, what what needs to be done 
what needs to be done to address the HIV and other prevention needs of black men who have sex with men and men who love men? Um, I mean, there's a hard one. Yeah, no, I mean, there's on so many levels, um, you know, I, th I think um, lots of structural, um, addressing a lot of structural racism has to be part of the agenda. So hopefully if we get past November 3rd, maybe we'll be on the road to kind of um, dealing with more of some of the root causes of some of, of the challenges. Um, you know, I, I think from from my vantage point, the place where I think, um, you know, um, where we need to make more of investment is uh, developing uh, a larger cadre of black and uh, other people of color um, of investigators to be leading many of these projects. So I feel like um, men mentoring of minority um, uh, research is one of the most important things that I can do at this stage of my life. As you've done throughout your career. You spent so much of your time at Brown and Miriam you know, that was, that was your, your, your other home. Um, I was wondering if Providence is still your home uh, at, at some level. Um, I love Providence, but, you know, particularly with the pandemic, I haven't, uh, I haven't been there very much. I mean, the people I work with at Brown, uh, you know, um, fantastic people. Um, I kept, you know, couldn't see everybody on, on, on mm -hmm. phone, but I see my colleague, Ronnie Cantor, uh, uh, dialed in uh, from Providence. And very sweet. Now, there a lot, lot of really great, great people. Uh, you know, but there really are two different worlds. And I, you know, again, this issue of like trying to do too much, I def, you know, the Red Island people say, well, why don't you move here? And I'd say, sort of like Goldilocks, because I was already in Boston for six years when I right. uh, first got uh, first position at Brown. And it was, uh, you know, uh, Providence is too small, New York's too big, Boston's about right, you know, <laughs> uh, kind of thing. Uh, but people thought I was crazy commuting. And I probably was commuting it through 95. I spent, you know, often would eat two meals a day in the car, you know, it's like, you just, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a crazy life, but, you know, um, so I, I, I was happy that I had the experience there, and, and, um, you know, and because Brown was smaller, there are a lot of things that could be done uh, that um, might be easier than in a, a place that has so much going on in terms of uh, uh, biomedical research, and uh, just in the Longwood area alone, but, but, you know, I'm really happy not to be commuting as much as I cherish many of the relationships, uh, some wonderful people there that I'm fortunate to still um, uh, stay in touch with. So what's Harvard really like? Um, it, it is, everybody's a tub on their own bottom, which for better or worse. <laughs> so you, you know, I'm, I'm at Fenway and have an affiliation with Harvard, but you know, but I spend 90 plus percent of my time uh, at Fenway. So, you know, with Particularly now with our Zoom realities, where where do any of us spend time? To, you know, go from one Zoom call to another. I, indeed, indeed. Well, we we love to have you full time here, uh, Ken. Um, so I, w w our our interview piece is going to end in a second, and we're going to go to other other Q and A. But I'm just curious, how has Boston changed in your years here? It's been a while. Um, you know, when um, I I remember it was at the Charles Stewart case. Mm -hmm. I mean, oh, so, well. Yeah, I mean, you know, the idea that that the city was so prepared to accept this uh, this Racist. story about a, a black man <laughs> killing killing his wife, and you know, and, and, and just it, there's so much ra racism embedded in the city when it first came, and you know, it's still, I'm, um, you know, and and um, when it first came, just listening to the stories of older Bostonians and just understanding that it was, uh, you know. Um, very much baked in the cake was just a sense of which neighborhoods had which people and and um, and people knew their place and um, you know but just not not as um, welcoming as one might want to think. I like to think that things have changed somewhat, but I still think we have a lot of residential segregation, a lot of um, a lot of challenges. But I but I think that there's uh, you know over the years much more of a appreciation of the importance of diversity and uh, um, much more um, social tolerance, you know, you know, on all kinds of levels, um, and people wanting to engage people from other other backgrounds. So, so I, I, I find it a more, you know, a, a more um, inclusive community. But again, I, I have the benefit of, you know, uh, being cisgender white male, you know, um, and of a certain age. So, so again, I may maybe um, 
also missing a lot of the, the rawness that many other people feel, many younger people and people of color still feel. Yeah, thanks for seeing that. Well, I've only touched on about eight pages of your 338 pages, uh, which is only one piece of who you are. Um, I'm sure, Joan, I think we're going to go to open Q&A for uh, everyone else. But I, I just want to, again, congratulate you, Ken, and thank you for your immense contributions to Boston, to the world. Um, I, many of my friends, including my husband, are alive today because of the work that you've done. And I thank you for that. Uh, Kevin, you're, you're too kind. But I, you know, I, one thing I meant to work into this conversation is that uh, Kevin is definitely a hero of the era too. Uh, somebody whose work needs recognition. I mean, Kevin is the master of divinity. He's now running a division of um, infectious diseases uh, during during a pandemic because he's been, um, you know, he's been at the forefront from the get-go, starting with the, the needs of LGBTQ youth back in the day when nobody was really advocating for them. So. Thank you for everything you've done, Kevin. Kind of you to say. Yeah. Okay, so I think we want to, if, if I could speak for the group, I'm going to take a moment and give a round of applause. If everybody would like to re unmute, I think that's really, uh, that's, that's really warranted right now. Um, thank you, Kevin. Terrific line of questioning. So for the, for the Q&A, um, this is what we can do. We have, you know, there's 46 people, but I think we can handle it. If you want to just unmute and ask your question, you should feel free. Um, otherwise, another way you could do it is if you type your uh, your question in the chat. I'll be I'll just read that I'll read that aloud so we can keep things keep things going. Um, so if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and um, you can direct them to Dr. Mayer. It's Bob Goldzer. Hi, Bobby. Um, how are you, Kenny? Good. Um, are you in Miami? Us, I'm in Miami, yes. Wow. Tell, us, uh, tell us about what you think about the future of funding for research in whether it's HIV, LGBTQ thing. Tell us what you think is your sense of future of funding and things we could do to make sure there is adequate funding. Yeah, well, I, I think a lot hinges on, you know, what happens at uh, this election. Um, you know, I've, I have no idea what would happen if uh, Trump were reelected and there's a, a Republican Senate. Uh, you know, I, I think because there's such a deficit, it would be, be easy enough to, to cut um, you know, vulnerable populations and research. They're certainly not very science oriented as it is. Um, you know, so, so that would be a concern. I would hope, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, because of uh, uh, Vice President Biden's um, and, and um, and with a lot of domestic work during the Obama administration where there was uh, uh, you know, an Office of National AIDS Policy and um, the NIH was highly regarded. I would uh, like to think that things would be uh, supported, but you know, uh, we're in such extraordinary period of time. So how we get through the next few months and next couple of years as we get past the pandemic may have a lot of implications um, in terms of what kind of resources are available for the work. I certainly don't think that there will be ideological barriers um, with the new um, Biden-Harris administration. Whereas I think uh, a Trump, uh, continued Trump administration and the uh, complexion of the new Supreme Court could be quite um, chilling. And you know, um, the NIH could easily be enjoined not to support certain kinds of research. So it's scary. Thanks. Um, there's a question coming in from the chat. Uh, th there's a question from uh, Mark Crone who's asking, uh, how did you deal with your own fear of exposure to HIV and AIDS in the early days? Uh, um, yeah, I mean, in the very earliest days, I think it, uh, you know, um, it's a lot younger. So I think there's a sense that you're invulnerable, number one, um, and, you know, and, um, certainly paid attention to uh, the infectious disease epidemiology. And, uh, um, you know, it was only, it, it fairly quickly it became clear to many of us that this was being transmitted by blood and intimate body fluids, and there were precautions that people could take. So, um, you know, there was, uh, you know, in the beginning, you know, first weeks or months, you couldn't say that there couldn't be airborne transmission, but it became pretty clear that it wasn't the case that there weren't, you know, um, household members weren't getting, um, uh, getting, getting sick. So, so I, I 
I, I think um, a, a little bit of bravado and a little um, bit of um, understanding the epidemiology early on I think, um, played a role. But but you know I, I think that um, you know um, there's sort of a premise if you're going into this line of work that there might be some risk. So I certainly um, thought that there's possibility. Certainly certainly for the longest time that we had effective treatment. We knew that if um, you know we were drawing blood, we had a risk of exposure to a spiky needle stick. So certainly that was a was a concern. But one would again try to uh, pay attention and, and minimize the risk whenever possible. Thank you. And there's a, there's another one in the chat from Julie Marston, and her question is: um, How can we apply some of the lessons learned from um, from your work in HIV research to COVID nineteen? Uh, yeah. Um, Thanks, Julie. Um, well, um, uh, the one the one lesson that already has been applied, you know, it's it's all two degrees of Tony Fauci. So um, I don't know if everybody's aware, but um, the um, the um, Operation Warp Speed trials are being conducted in what's called the COVID nineteen prevention network, and that, for the most part, is uh, Dr. Fauci uh, giving marching orders to people at the NIH, and then. Uh, the leadership of these uh, of net HIV networks saying, uh, uh, tomorrow you're going to, be, uh, in addition to HIV pre uh, prevention research, you're going to be doing COVID vaccine trials. So um, uh, Fenway, along with uh, Mass General Brigham uh, uh, and BMC, um, are all part of this COVID vaccine uh, trials network and, um, and being, um, we're working on different protocols. So, so one of the lessons of HIV was how you organize the conduct of these large clinical trials to do, do research, and they've been uh, repurposed now uh, for COVID-19 work. So that's, that's something where, you know, probably getting, um, probably people would be afraid of the reaction uh, um, in the White House if um, Dr. Fauci got too much credit for doing this, but that was, you know, um, the NIH saying, you already are paying to, you know, for nurses and physicians and research coordinators and labs to be able to do these clinical trials, we've got a new set of clinical trials we've got to do. So we're the effectors of, of what the vaccine manufacturers are com coming up with. Um, but I, th I think the other issues are that, with, you know, COVID-19, uh, we writ large, we know that um, uh, various disenfranchised communities are most highly impacted by the pandemic. So again, speaks to the need to do community education. Um, you know, for HIV vaccine work, uh, we have, uh, our site is all the sites who do this work have um, a staffer whose full-time work is around community education. We luckily have a really brilliant person uh, uh, at Fenway now, um, Adriana Boulan, who spends a lot of time networking with the community. Uh, and you know, prior to COVID-19, it was around HIV, but now she's um, talking to the Black and Mysterial Alliance uh, and other um, uh, community groups about um, uh, why COVID. Uh, um, uh, vaccine and other kinds of research is so important uh, for the community because there obviously are legacies of community mistrust and particularly uh, given who's in the White House, there's ample reason why uh, uh, people of color may, may have significant mistrust about uh, projects that seem to be rushed uh, too quickly. Uh, so, so we need to do a lot of community education. That's really a, a lesson from the HIV work. That's fascinating. Um, and then here, here's one coming in from Neil Kane. Um, which is based on the wisdom you've accumulated over the course of your career. If there is one piece of wisdom you can impart to a first year medical student, what would it be? Um, first year medical student, I'd say uh, keep an open mind and, and you know, it's great. It's great that you went to medical school because you think you want to do X, but um, I always thought it was weird when they, when I, when I used to hear it called, undergraduate medical education is another term for medical school. I thought, you know, it's four years, it's so intense. How can you call that undergraduate? And then I realized that is like another undergraduate degree. It's, it's specialized, but you take a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And, and there are things that you don't even know that you would like that you end up finding incredibly interesting. Like uh, who knew that histology could be so fascinating? I mean, looking at slides of tissues with different staining, but if you start understanding like how the human body is put together. So, so, you know, so somebody goes to medical school, I would urge them um, as a first year uh, person, the science is going to change. A lot of things will change by the time you finish the four years. Um, and even when you do your residency, a lot of, you know, a lot of residencies are, unless you know you're going to go into primary care, you probably will be doing more training after that. So just 
keep an open mind and eventually it will be um, you know, successive approximations that you will get there. Uh, we'll figure out what you want it to be once you've been doing it for a few years. That's great. And uh, congratulations to Neil on being accepted to medical school. So <laughs> I don't know what that, where that question came from. Uh, this mystery person, uh, Joan Alakwa, has a question, which is a little on the nose. Are there any historical figures who have influenced you? Um, well, the initial uh, decision to go to medicine, I'd say Freud, actually. So, uh, but, um, but uh, you know, uh, there's there's somebody. Um, well, actually, many historians on the call, so you might know Rudolf Virchow, V I R C H O W. So he's a very famous um, um, uh, pathologist of the 19th century, but he also was uh, uh, an activist and uh, very much felt that um, that you know medicine was was very much social in nature. So he was one of the uh, uh, first, uh, you know, so social sort of public health oriented uh, kind, kinds of figures. Great. Um, if there's any other brave soul who would like to ask a question, I would definitely encourage you to unmute and go ahead and do so. All right. Uh, so I'm going to call it and say that that's, that's the end of the Q&A. So uh, one more round of applause for uh, Dr. Mayer and for, of course, for Kevin for facilitating. I thought that was wonderful. I learned a lot. We'll do that. Yay. Ken. Um, Dr. Mayer, do you, have, do you happen to have the award near you? You say you can show it off? Because usually, usually we do like a big thing where we, where we hand it off. In the other room, I'll be right back. <laughs> sure, sure. I'll vamp, don't worry about it. Uh, oh, we can talk about them. There we go. Okay, great. Yay, congratulations. Okay. Um, so over the course of the month of October, to celebrate our honorees, as well as LGBTQ History Month, the History Project is aiming to raise $25,000 to support our work. Work that ranges from building archival collections that tell the complex and diverse histories of our LGBTQ community, to providing spaces both in person and online where community members can come together to learn, to tell their stories, and to share in creating LGBTQ history. As of tonight, we've already raised 55% towards our $25,000 goal. If everyone on the, on the call tonight donated just $50, we'd be at 75% and right on track to hitting that goal. Your support tonight and throughout the month is what makes our work possible. It's what makes it possible for us to put together in-person and online events that challenge and inform and entertain. Your support makes it possible for activist and archivist volunteers to have a safe place to organize and preserve the historical records, photographs, and publications that tell our community's story. And your support is what makes it possible for us to digitize those historical materials so we can share them with community members and researchers across the world. We all have stories to tell, and it's the mission of the History Project to document and preserve those stories and to share them with the world. We hope you'll make a donation tonight to help the History Project reach our fundraising goal. Visit historyproject.org support to make a donation. And of course, we'll put that link in the chat as well. Um, so just to wrap up, we really hope that you that you'll uh, tell others about the history project and the work that's being done uh, by the organization. That you berate your group text and your close friends to follow them on Instagram, and as well to sign up for this event series. Uh, because I hope that you'll join us as we celebrate history make makers all month. Next Thursday, we'll be joined by History Maker Award honoree, uh, Dr. Thea James. Dr. James is an Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine at Boston Medical Center, um, Boston University School of Medicine. She has dedicated her career to public health, equity, and community, and has made a significant impact addressing violence and trauma in communities. So I'm really looking forward to that conversation next week, same time. Yes. Thank you all for your support and for joining us this evening, and good night. Hope to see you next week. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Congratulations.